I have the pleasure to have with me today Professor Lorenz Kiermeyer. Uh, Professor Kiermeyer is psychiatrist, director of the Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry at McGill University, editor-in-chief of uh, Transcultural Psychiatry, uh, that is the official journal of the section of Transcultural Psychiatry of the World Psychiatric Association, uh, he works in the broad area of cultural psychiatry, including the mental health of indigenous peoples, immigrants and refugees, global mental health and the anthropology and philosophy of psychiatry. First of all, Professor, what is the relation between mental illness and cultural context? Well, I think the current perspective of cultural psychiatry is that uh, there's no human experience, no human functioning that is not in some sense cultural. Uh, we're cultural beings. We're born with immature brains that then spend several decades acquiring culture. Mm -hmm. Our brains are in effect sculpted by particular social worlds that are uh, shot through with particular cultural history and forms of life and that becomes constitutive of who we are. So that is quite broadly true of every aspect aspect of experience and it's certainly true of, of mental health and mental illness specifically. As a result of that, as a result of the fact that we only become uh, functioning human beings by acquiring language, by acquiring culture, um, the ways that things can go wrong are also shaped by culture. So the most basic answer would be that uh, there's no mental illness without a cultural dimension to it just as there's no recovery without a cultural dimension, mm -hmm. uh, that that dimension, uh, or those dimensions, I should say, really, uh, are there from the beginning, developmentally. Mm -hmm. uh, they're there in the processes of uh, things going wrong. Uh, and um, we can sort of unpack that. I mean, culture itself is sort of a placeholder for many different processes. Mm -hmm. uh, it speaks to the idea that we live in an environment that we ourselves have constructed cooperatively, and that's maintained not only by uh, physical structures and, and forms of life, uh, but by uh, a shared history that is sedimented in language, that is present in um, the ways that we look at the world, the ways that we respond, and so on. So if you take that perspective seriously, and I think it's a very solid perspective, we can you know, um, point to all kinds of of evidence for that, um, how, how central that is in our lives, uh, then it means that we can hardly get going on a description of psychopathology without having to begin to use concepts and um, uh, frameworks that come from particular cultural perspectives. Usually when we try to just sort of list the dimensions or the ways in which culture plays a role, we would begin with something obvious like the ways people express suffering vary with the vocabulary that they have, with the conceptual models that they have, and so on. Uh, but it's equally true that the causes of mental illness are shaped by cultural factors. Uh, we know that social determinants are among the most powerful influences on mental health. Mm -hmm. Experiences of loss, of uh, the rupture of relationships, experiences of racism, discrimination, of marginalization, disempowerment. These are very powerful um, determinants of health because of how we're, we're constructed as human beings. And those kinds of structural issues themselves depend on particular ways of life, particular values, culturally constructed categories, I mean, who is, is, you know, assumes a certain position in society and so on. So causal factors are also shaped by mm -hmm. culture. And then if we ask how do people then cope with a problem that's gone wrong, well, they marshal resources, ways of thinking about themselves, ways of interpreting experience, ways of engaging other people that are also um, embedded in a particular cultural world. Okay. So uh, health is possible on, only in a cultural context. Well, human existence is possible only in a, a cultural context. We can have something that lo you know, looks like a form for us, the sort of Robinson Crusoe version, but we know that without uh, the capacity, you know, the opportunity to develop a language, a shared language, a shared worldview, it would be a very faint shadow of what we understand to be a, a, a human life. Okay, thank you. Um, how should clinicians overcome the issue of the variability in the expression, in the cultural expression of mental illness? Yeah. Well, uh, from what I've said, if we, if, 
it, it sort of makes us realize that every clinical encounter is in some sense intercultural. Even if we come from the same background, there will be differences between us by virtue of age, of gender, of education, of social position. And some of those can be thought about as cultural in a sense as well, because along with something like gender comes a certain set of assumptions sure. which vary in different you know, places. Even within a, a place like Italy, they vary north, south, and so on. You could point to important differences that then affect how people think about themselves, how they talk, and so on. So from that point of view, uh, that kind of cultural difference is present all the time. It may be not noticed. If we assume that we're very similar, then it falls entirely into the background and we don't problematize it. Certain kinds of difference are recognized and sometimes they're treated as obstacles. That we're so different, we don't share, an, uh, in a very concrete sense, we don't share a common language or we superficially we share a common language but we're really referring to very different life worlds. And then we have a challenge of finding a uh, kind of shared horizon but also of honoring the difference in some ways. And I would say w my own approach to this begins with a kind of perspective inspired in part by Levinas of acknowledging that difference, that alterity is fundamental to the human condition mm -hmm. and that it calls forth from us a kind of attitude of, of respect, of openness, of humility, of vulnerability when we realize that we can't fully understand another person, that that's just the human condition. And as a helper, we therefore have to maintain a constant openness and a constant negotiation with people to find a, a shared understanding of a way to go forward. So that, that issue of stance to me is the most important thing. That's, we can talk about other technical and practical strategies, but I think that basic attitude is, is really key. People who go into the helping professions strongly want to be able to connect to other people and to be useful. And sometimes that leads us to ignore differences or to kind of try to slide around them. And in the process, we can do kind of interpretive violence to someone. We can assimilate their, their experience to our own construction. And uh, perhaps because they want to please us as well or they're in a, uh, a subdominant uh, position in power, they may not point out to us that we're really misunderstanding or not quite grasping what their experience is. So that attitude is essentially uh, is very important. And if you have that attitude, then you're alert to the possibility that you may be misunderstanding, that you may be glossing over some important differences. And then there's a sort of... Um, a, a process, a communicative process that's founded on that realization and a kind of ethical stance of exploring with the person what things mean, uh, whether your, your sense of what's going on makes sense to them and so on. So those, that communicative function uh, would be, again, central to our strategies for, for dealing with difference. Uh, and I think also we need to not look at difference as just something as a barrier to get over. We need to view it as a source of identity, as a source of um, the uniqueness of all our experience and to, and to try to explore it. So our clients, our patients are our teachers. There are, we're accompanying each other on some kind of a path and we can really learn from each other in the process. That, um, that relational context of, of being a helper and working with difference is a kind of a microcosm of what hopefully happens in a larger society, which is that uh, people can live out their difference in a way as a contribution to society, as a, a kind of diversity that then is a strength, is a richness, is a, uh, a kind of, uh, yeah. exactly. So I think that's, you know, grosso modo, that's the framework. The question then is within that, how do we recognize when there's a breakdown in misunderstanding, uh, uh, in our mutual understanding, and how do we, what categories do we have for thinking about that? So for example, in uh, DSM-5, uh, the notion of um, of uh, cultural concepts of distress was introduced to acknowledge the fact that people have local idiomatic ways of expressing suffering. You might talk about nerves, or you might talk about attacas de nervios, or you might talk about uh, different and things. Different symptoms. Exactly. So, and the clinician needs to hear that not only as okay, those are certain symptoms, and I'm going to map those onto some disorder that I recognize, but needs to understand that that way of talking is part of a local world. It's part of a process of the person positioning themselves vis-a-vis -vis other people, part of them articulating their suffering. And if you understand it from that more pragmatic, communicative view, then the, the language that they're using that might be unfamiliar becomes an opening into understanding more about their local context. So we're doing a translation not only to um, can we map this onto certain disorders or classes of problems that we have some understanding of and some tools to help with, but also can we map it onto a life world and a social world 
uh, in a way. So the life world would be the phenomenological part, but equally important is the social world, which is around the person, which involves other people, which involves conflicts between other people, and finding a, a, a way to get at some kind of a picture of that as well. Thank you very much. Um, considering what you've said, uh, what are the implications for a conception of mental illness based on a biopsychosocial approach? Well, I think that the biopsychosocial approach, which, as you know, has also received some criticism for being a little too facile and maybe not having been fleshed out in a way, I think it points toward the, the reality that we are multi-level, multi-scale beings, that we, you know, from our cells to our communities to global society, that we're embedded and interacting with all these um, uh, scales of, and, and levels of, of experience, and that when we formulate a health problem, we need to, at least the clinician needs to be thinking in those terms. Not every patient has the interest to sort of put it all together, but whether they think about it or not, they're embedded in it. So our task is to get some kind of a, a picture of that, and then to find, uh, to find ways to, to intervene. Um, and the way I would put it sort of succinctly in terms of mental health and psychiatry or psychology in particular is that if we're trying to understand problems of the mind or problems of the psyche or problems of the soul, we need to understand that the circuits of the mind are not just in the brain, they're actually out into the social world. And as Gregory Bateson, as, as uh, um, other yeah. social psychologists and so on argued, we need a kind of ecology of mind yeah. in which we're going to characterize not only the ways that cognitive functioning or emotional functioning can go wrong, but the ways in which those uh, engagements with the world that uh, expect a certain kind of hospitable environment, in w ways in which those can go wrong. And that would be part of our, our, um, our typology of problems, part of our, uh, our conceptual models, and ultimately part of our toolkit uh, for intervention. I would like to thank you, Professor Kirmaya, for being with us and for sharing your, your knowledge. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much.